Well, this morning we're going to continue in our series that we started last week called Status. And in particular, this morning we're going to be... Uh, I mean, last week we talked about friend requests, and I pulled my phone out because this morning we're going to address an area in our lives that people are really, really uh, absorbed with sometimes. And the title of this morning's message is Selfie Addiction. Come on, let's be honest. How many of you have ever taken a selfie? Take out your phones. Here, I'm going to take one with you guys. Ready? This isn't a selfie. This is a groupie. Ready? Oh, it's facing the screen. Ready? Everybody say cheese. All right. That's a groupie. But this morning, we're going to look at selfie addiction. And I've even brought a selfie stick. And so, pretty cool. But if you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be, read verses 1 through 7. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. <clears throat> but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, un unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your presence in, your, in this place. Thank you for your love and your grace upon us. Father, we're asking you right now in the name of Jesus that you will speak to us very clearly through your word. Help us, Lord God, to get your word into our spirits, to apply it into our lives so that we could not only be hearers, but we would be doers of your word today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We live in such a self-absorbed world. How many of you agree with that? We're selfie-driven. In fact, we're, I want you to pay attention to the screen real quick. We have a little video on the proper ways to take a selfie. Before we get started, here's what you will need. A camera phone or some kind of tablet device. And of course, yourself. Other optional props can include, but are not limited to, pets, coffee, or a bicycle. Step one, location. Finding the perfect location for your selfie is very important. Here are some classic choices to help you get started. The bathroom, the woods. In the car, make sure you get the seatbelt in there. The dressing room or the gym, a fun way to show off all your muscles and annoy all your followers. Step two, facial preparation. Like any professional, practice makes perfect. And the only way to get the perfect selfie is by training. Check your teeth, tussle your hair, fix your eyebrows, suck it in, flex those <laughs> biceps, pucker those lips, all right, good. Step three, angles away. Find the angle that works best for you. Here are some helpful options. The hello up there, this is a selfie taken from a high angle in hopes of making the subject seem slimmer. Objects may be larger than they appear. The nostril shot. More commonly taken by children or people who have no depth perception whatsoever. The low angle, or more commonly known as the double chin. Not recommended. Step four, choose your expression. The possibilities are endless. There's the duck face. The, oh, I didn't see you there. Seen commonly in hipster circles. The tough guy, typically taken while pumping iron. The, I'm so excited. This one can be multifunctional, great for when you get engaged, and equally as great for covering up when you haven't. Once steps one through four are complete, you are ready to take your selfie. Oh, and multiple attempts are highly encouraged. Step five, choose your filter. Apply the filter that makes you look the most tan and least washed up. Step six, post to the social media site of your choosing and just wait for the likes to roll in. Got it? I think you're ready. Now, 
It's your turn. Let me take a selfie. That's right. I'm speaking to you. Pull out those phones. Take out those tablets. It's time to put these tips into action. Use her with your arms crossed. Go on. Get your phone out. Ladies, begin digging through your purses and get those cameras ready. All right. Here we go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Take that selfie. Selfies are selfies are let me just let me just say this for all of you that are a little concerned right now. Selfies in itself is not sinful. The behavior behind a selfie can be. We live in a world that is so self absorbed, and God cannot bless selfishness. Amen. So when you look at the word selfie, and I know some of you have never taken one, and God bless you. But the self, let me just explain where, 10 years ago, I never would have thought I'd be studying the research of a selfie. Or social media at all. But social media can be used for good or it can be used for bad. What is the background of the selfie? Did you know that, the, that selfie was Oxford Dictionary's Word of the Year in 2013? Word of the Year. Why are close-up pictures of oneself so popular? You find an interesting background, strike a pose, you get those duck lips out. If you've done it and you're laughing because you've done it, I know you have. You raise your eyebrows. I've never seen a female duck, I mean a female selfie without their eyebrows raised. You raise your eyebrows, you make sure you get your best side, and then you snap away. We even have celebrities like Kim Kardashian, Kardashian, who wrote a book titled Selfish. And in her book, she explains the importance of taking and posting selfies. From celebrities, actors, musicians, athletes, political people all around the world posting selfies and then they get shared a million times over. Friends, we're living in a society today that is so self-absorbed, we're so self-driven, it's really sickening, isn't it? God is wanting some humility, he's wanting humble people, not selfish people, not self-absorbed people, and God's not going to move in a nation that is so self-absorbed. Righteousness exalts the nation, not selfiness, right? So this morning, as we look at this world that you and I live in, we get caught up in sometimes. Do not be conformed to the things of this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. How do we, in 2017, channel through this self-absorbed world? First thing I want to look at this morning is number one. Selfie versus selfless. What's the problem? Do we take selfies to get attention? Do we promote self to get attention? Self really is I want my way. I, I, I want people to see me. I want people to know about me. I want this. I want that. I want everybody to know about me. And so do we post selfies? Do we impose ourselves because we're just wanting attention? Facebook metrics of likes, comments, friends, and views are like money to many people today. The more we have, the richer we feel. Snapping a selfie isn't a sin, but it could be the result of other deeper problems. How many of you know this morning that we have identity issues in America today? We've said it before, but we have identity issues in America. Most people don't know who they are in Christ Jesus. People, people you ask uh, young people or even, any, even adults today, who are you? What are you about? Where are you headed? What are your core values for your life? And they look at you like a, a, a cow at an open gate. Huh? What is a core value? I got to the core of an apple one time, but what, what do we, what do we, we don't know who we are sometimes because we have identity issues in America. Psalms 139 says this, you are, you are feel, fearfully and wonderfully made. Your identity is found no other than in Christ Jesus. 
Self-esteem is at an all-time low, not just in America, but even in the church today. I don't know how many people I've met who have come to an altar, given their life to Jesus Christ, got baptized, started working and serving in the church to some degree, but still struggling with self-esteem. There's, a, there's two sides that is going on in the, in the church of America. We have some conceited Christians, and then we have some Christians who don't even know who they are. Conceited folks are people who don't know who they are either. Whether your, your self-esteem is way down in the dumps, or you're way up here above everybody else, we don't know who we really are. We're like that uh, song that the Who wrote, Who are you? Who, who? Oh, y'all a bunch of sinners. Y'all sit, my gosh. Secular music. <clears throat> Self-esteem. If you can't look yourself in the mirror and know who you are in Jesus Christ, we have an identity problem. Amen? Then you have others who just are stuck on themselves. They think they're all that in a bag of chips. You know those folks, right? You've seen them. You've met them. They... Paul in 2 Timothy verse 3 said, For men will be lovers of themselves. As I was reading 2 Timothy 3, I was reading it and thinking, My goodness, was Paul writing about 2017? Self-absorbed. Lovers of ourselves. Lovers of pleasure. Lovers of all this is going on. This is the most dangerous human trait because it's the root of many bigger problems. When we become lovers of our own selves, like, like Paul is speaking of right here. We're to love ourselves, love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but we're not to be stuck on ourselves. Amen? How many of you understand this, this this morning, that the devil is a liar? He is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Look at Ezekiel twenty-eight twelve. <clears throat> Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is speaking of Satan. The devil's preoccupation with his beauty, his self, led to pride. Satan became so self-absorbed. Satan was the inventor of an evil selfie. He didn't have an iPhone. He didn't have a camera. But he seen himself above God. He's seen himself more beautiful than God. How many of you know that scripture's true? Your pride will lead to a fall. What did God do to Satan? He kicked him out of heaven. Worship leader, kicked out. Rebuked from heaven. This led to, become, this led to Satan becoming God's adversary. It all started with a preoccupation of self. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. In which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Satan uses his evil influence to broadcast this attitude to the world around us. Satan is influencing not only this culture, but he's influenced every culture since the beginning of time to be focused on self. Why is there so much... Uh, sex trafficking going on in America today, some little girl gets attention from somebody, and I'm not blaming the little girl, but these little pred these predators that the enemy has released out here, stealing our young ladies all across America, and then using them for sex things all across this nation. Satan has perverted this country, and he's doing so a a countless times every single day. We become so self-absorbed. How can I get better? How can, how can I get richer? How can I get above, up one more step on the ladder? Who do I got to step on to get there? Satan is using his lies. It all started with a preoccupation of self. Friends, if you are self-absorbed, then you're living a lie from the enemy. God is looking for people who understand who they are in him. People who are not absorbed with self, but understand what it means to be selfless. We need to, we need to adopt the same principle that John the Baptist adopted in John 3.30. Look there. John had a very simple, simple vision statement, mission statement for his life. What did John say? He must increase, I must decrease. Everyone say that with me. 
He must increase, I must decrease. The way for you and I to go up is for us to go down. We lay our life down for, for the Lord Jesus Christ, lay our life down for others, and then he lifts us up. If we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, Scripture's clear, he will lift us up. That's, that's got to be our motto. That's got to be something we, you and I adopt. He must increase, I must decrease. Number two, living a fulfilled life. <clears throat> a lot of folks don't understand the difference between a full life and a fulfilled life. There is a huge, huge difference in having a full life and a fulfilled life. Because if I just focus on having a full life, then that means whatever is causing me to be full will eventually go away and now I can become empty. But if, I have a, if I'm living a fulfilled life, I'm never going to be empty. Because something is fulfilling for me. We've got to understand the difference between full lives and fulfilled lives. If I eat one meal today, I haven't eaten yet. I'm getting hungry. If I eat one meal, I'm going to be full for right now. When that meal is digested and it's no longer inside of my system, I will become hungry again and I will want to eat something again that will fill me up. But if I find something that is fulfilling, like Jesus, and I partake of all the goodness that he has for me, and I taste and see that he is good, I am now fulfilled, and I won't thirst again, I won't hunger again, because he is in me, and he's living in me. I like what Jesus said in John chapter 4, go there. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is the key to living a fulfilled life. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well right here. It, and but Friends, I get thirsty. I, I carry a bottle of water to the uh, platform, not because I thirst, because my voice gets dry when I speak, but Every day I get thirsty. Me and Sister Jane drink a couple pots of coffee and every day. But I get thirsty and I grab something to try to satisfy my thirst. But Jesus is offering us something past being full. Listen, Jesus isn't the Chinese buffet. You go to the buffet and an hour later you're hungry again. You're full for a moment. Jesus is offering us something that is very fulfilling for a lifetime. So we've got to understand the difference between a full life and a fulfilled life. The, the issue with the many of us in, in our churches today is we spend most of our lives chasing things that fill us up. How many people do you know that have had career changes because they started off in one field, but that it, it no longer filled them up? Now they're not happy with that, that career path. They're not joyful in that career path. So now they've changed paths again because they're not full. They're not, and here's the real issue, they're not fulfilled. You find a job that God's called you to that is fulfilling, you'll never work a day of your life. You'll enjoy everything you do because it's fulfilling. Amen? <clears throat> no matter how much you attempt to satisfy the thirst of your flesh, your spirit will never be satisfied without being filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we long to feel loved. But no matter how many relationships we have with people, we still need a deeper love relationship with Jesus Christ. We long to have purpose. We try to determine what we really enjoy doing and then pick that career path or, or pick that college career or that college class or we pick this or that. We try to determine what will really bring us joy. And so we try to fill all of that with what we perceive to be the answers for our happiness. I mean, after all, isn't America telling us about the pursuit of happiness? Happiness is an emotional state of mind. Happiness is, is temporary. I'm not always happy. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not always happy being a pastor. I'm just being real. But I can, even in my unhappy times, I'm still joyful because my joy comes from the Lord. My fulfillment comes from my relationship with him, not from people around me. Amen? 
I've got joy unspeakable and full of glory, right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Not my happiness is my strength. Not my situation is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. No matter how successful we become, we will still feel that we are not fulfilling our purpose if we've not allowed God to fulfill every area of our life. People thirst for true joy. They take all these different vacations and nothing wrong with vacations. But people's always chasing thrills. They're always chasing the next big boat, the next big thing, the next this or that to try to find fulfillment. Why is it that men get to a certain age, midlife era, and they have a midlife crisis? And the reason is that sometimes there's not, they're not really finding what really is fulfilling to them. Why do parents, and I know I'm, my, my wife and I are dealing with it right now. We've got our oldest son going to leave home in a, in a couple months for college. And, but I'm praying now, Lord, I know he's leaving. He has to leave. I may have to push him out. I don't, but you have family members who get through that emptiness area and they, they, they put so much focus on their kids that now they find themselves not being fulfilled because they, their kids were filling them but not fulfilling them. Amen? And you, you get everybody at every stage of life, and there, there is a stage every time, every, every decade we go through stages of life, right? I mean, when you were 30, it was okay, but once you hit 40, everything started to droop a little bit. When you hit 50, I, I mean, you go through stages, right? And so if we try to fill our lives based on the stages we go through with what we are absorbed with, we're not going to be fulfilled. We're going to keep searching and searching and searching for things that fill us, but not fulfill us. We'll drink up whatever everyone else around us is drinking and not drink of the living water that Jesus provides, driven by self. We need a true encounter with God. We need a real encounter with the living God every single day. We need to be humble. We need to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I need you. I need you, Lord. Friends, there's a living God that's available to you and I every single day. A living God. I assure you that today, the Spirit of the Lord is here, whether you feel Him or not. I get a little concerned when people say they come to service and they didn't feel God. Something's wrong with your feeler. Because my Bible tells me that when two or three are gathered in His name, He promises that His presence will be there. Here's the issue. Self-absorbed people, I don't feel the presence of God the way I want to feel the presence of God. Amen? Every week, if we tried to copycat every service... We would be putting God into a box. Every week, if I tried to preach the way I preached one particular message, that's putting God in a box. We can't put God in a box, not if we want to be fulfilled. We have to, for a fresh encounter with God, every time you wake up, every time you seek Him, you've got to seek Him and just be ready to experience what He has for you that day. Don't, don't determine that it's going to be like yesterday or last year or 40 years ago. His mercies are new every morning. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, I'll be there. How many of you know this is this morning, God's beginning to, to spread revival fires in America again? I don't know about you, but I, the more we pray here at this church, the more we gather, the more we, we're doing things. Uh, and I'm sensing it and I'm seeing it. Uh, first Wednesdays, God's moving. And, and our prayer times on Thursdays and our prayer times on Sunday mornings, just people. And you, God, the embers of God's flames are starting to, to, to get brighter and brighter. Amen? And I like the, what one of the old, old evangelists of old said, Charles Finney, I believe. He said, if you will get on fire... People will come from miles and miles away to come and watch you burn. Bless them. We need some, and I believe, I feel it, I sense revival fires of God. And I'm not talking about a man walking in with, a, with an evangelist walking in or this or that. And we will have some of those. But I'm talking about true, true revival that begins with you and I. Revival that happens in your home. And then it translates into the region around us, and it happens in the church. 
I feel this. I feel that. Selfless people won't experience that. Humble people will. Hungry people will, ex- will experience true revival. Selfie says, hey, look at me. Selfless people says, hey, look at him. Number three, it's time to die. I got something really encouraging for you to say to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to die. What are you dying to? You're going to die to yourself. Die to yourself. We've got to die to ourselves. Above all else, we've got to love one another. Look at John 13, 34 and 35. It seems to be a theme here lately in the church. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for another. Church attendance and your depth of theological understanding will not get you there. The answer is to love one another. The Prince of Grenada in the late 1800s was put into prison. It was a like solitary confinement. The only thing he was given in prison in solitary confinement was a Bible. Upon his death, they went in and they looked at the walls of this cave, of that he, of this solitary confinement that he was imprisoned in, and they seen all these marks on the wall he had written on the wall that there were 66 books of the bible he had written on the wall how many verses there were in the bible he had written that the middle verse of the middle chapter of psalms 119 was the exact middle of the bible he had written all this great knowledge on the walls about the bible he had all this theological understanding but nowhere on the walls of this prison Did they ever see where he wrote that he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior? So friends, that tells me it goes beyond our theological understanding. Amen? I I love it when I love new Christians. They're as raw as raw could be. They don't know any better. And I praise God that they don't know any better yet. And God, please help them get a good person to disciple them and teach them way, the ways they should go. Because there are some folks that's discipled people wrong. Amen? Can I tell you right now? Whoever taught the church that the altar was only for bad people is theologically in error. You don't just come to the altar because you stink. Amen? That's wrong. The answer is to love one another. You know, I was researching selfies. This, this, I don't know why this stat floored me. But there are 93 million selfies taken each day. You heard me. 93 million selfies taken each day. Young ladies, women in the church, let me talk to you for a minute. 16 to 25 year old girls and women take five hours of selfies each week. Guys, quit laughing. According to Ohio State professor Jesse Fox, men who post a lot of selfies tend to exhibit higher levels of narcissism and psychopathy. If I see another man post a ducky, a ducky lip selfie or a selfie with that stupid puppy dog filter, I'm going to throw up. Come on. Amen. When I see, it's one thing for girls to do all that and all these different filters, but when I see a selfie of a man with big puppy dog ears and a tongue coming out of his mouth like a dog, I'm like, good Lord, that guy's got problems. He needs Jesus. We've got to we, we really come on. I mean, seriously. There's pet selfies, duck face selfies, me and my BFF selfies bathroom selfies who really wants to see you take a picture of yourself in the bathroom that is ridiculous come on we've got to die to ourselves. amen i've seen some i i love going to the gym but you're never going to see me going 
Uh uh-uh. uh. Not because I don't got it, but I'm just not going to do it. I don't have it either, but. <laughs> Jesus' message is very clear, friends. Love one another and deny yourself. Selfies are only, selfies are only right as long as the behavior is right and you aren't self centered. We've got to live with compassion. Others first mentality. Jesus was moved, not with self. Jesus was moved with compassion. Look at John 14, 14. Is it there? There we go. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had what? Compassion on them and healed their sick. Jesus, I'm sorry, not John 14, Matthew 14, 14. Jesus does not say, Nowhere does Jesus ever say, I need some me time. Now, don't get me wrong. You need to take a Sabbath. You need to rest and relax and chill. But when your me time becomes so focused, self-focused, we get locked in our man cave. We get get locked in this that we're never, ever moved with compassion. We're never doing what God's called us to do. We've got a self-absorbed problem. Amen? Jesus never said, I need some me time. He had compassion and he acted on it. See, the more I'm obsessed with Jesus, the less I care about me and the more I care about other people. We are fulfilled when we fill ourselves with the fire of compassion. Brings me to point number four. We've got to focus on the heart. Focus on the heart. What what about our inner character? You know what I've learned about social media? You learn a lot about people on social media. They tell all about their business. I've learned a lot about folks in our church. Some of you love your garden. That's awesome. When you get the harvest from that, please share. Some of you love your kids, your grandkids. That's amazing. Some people right now are so focused and filled with hate on social media, all they can post is what they hate and despise about the president or what they hate and despise about this or what they hate and despise about that. And what they're really saying is, I'm imposing my self-views on all of my followers right now. We've got to die to ourselves. Amen? We've got to focus on the heart, our inner character. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, I don't have any to braid, and the putting on of of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is God's sight, which in God's sight is very precious. How many of you got up this morning and spent hours trying to figure out what you're going to wear to church? Don't raise your hand. Oh, I promise you I don't spend hours trying to braid my hair. I've got a great barber. He he cuts it every other day. We get so self-absorbed. The Bible tells us not to focus on the outward appearance, but on your inner character, your inner qualities. For people today going through, divorce is nasty, amen? Amen. Praise God, God heals and he moves on and people move on. But can I just say something real quick? If you married your spouse because of the way they look, that's like buying a car for the paint job. Eventually that paint fades. Amen? My wife, when she first seen me walk through the doors of Burwell Assembly of God in Burwell, Nebraska, she thought she died and went to heaven. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the first thing she said to herself, and she'll, she would tell you this. That guy has no hair. I was balding. I have the McDonald's M right here. I can grow hair. I just choose to shave it. And when I told her I was 20 years old, she didn't believe me because I had this. But she, praise God, she didn't fall in love with me because... 
of my receding hairline. That's just a landing strip for the Holy Spirit, Brother Bill. Right there, right there. She didn't fall in love with me for that. We fell in love with each other. I think she's dropped dead gorgeous, but we fell in love with each other because of the inner qualities of our lives. Our love for Jesus. Amen? If anyone ever enters into a relationship for physical attraction only, you're in for a world of hurt. There's some girls from high school that I thought was the ugliest thing since the ugly duckling. And today, they look great. I don't know if it's wrinkle cream or what it is, but they look great. We can't judge by outward appearance. Look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. If your life is selfie driven, then it's time to reset, reassess your life. Take time to be social. Take time to develop and cultivate healthy, positive relationships. More than anything, make sure your heart, your inward character, and your motivations are pleasing to God. God's wanting to give us a heart of fire. Amen? A heart on fire, a heart of fire. It's hard to be selfish when your heart is focused on others. Compassionate heart that is blazing with the fire of God. What does compassion do? Compassion interrupts. Compassion interrupts. Mark 6, Jesus and his disciples, they were dog dead tired. Over 5,000 people are there. They're hungry. Jesus and the disciples are tired and they're hungry. But compassion interrupts. Jesus was moved with compassion about those people. Guys, I know you're tired. I know you're hungry. But what, we've got to feed these people. What are we going to feed them, Lord? We don't have any Lunchables. Pizza Hut's closed. McDonald's is not even around. Taco Bell's $5 box isn't available. What are we going to feed them? This little boy had this little sack lunch. Jesus being tired, being hungry. Blesses it, multiplies it, feeds not only 5,000, but the, those with them, and then there's leftovers. Come on. Amen? Compassion interrupts. We are, here's where, where self-absorbed comes in. I'm too tired, I'm too busy. Someone, one of our pastors in our section posted yesterday that as he was leaving La Somme, Louisiana School of Ministry. I thought it was so awesome. He decided to take one of the service roads through Kasachi National Forest. He didn't know why. But as he did, he come across a, motor, a guy on a motorbike, dirt bike, who had crashed his motorcycle. Had left his phone in his truck so he could ride the dirt trails through Kasachi. Praise God that compassion interrupted somebody's life. And God used a man to minister to somebody in their time of need. How many opportunities do you and I miss? Because we are so self-focused. I've got to get to the store. My wife said, get bread, milk, and this. And if I don't get it, she's going to beat me. Compassion interrupts. I get... And I'm not, I'm not saying this to rebuke anyone in this church or to say anything bad about anybody in this church. I've been here, what, eight months. And I'm, get, I get, I'm getting really, really frustrated with hearing this. I can't stand Leesville. I can't stand Vernon Parish. This place is grimy. This place is Sleesville. This is junk. This is this or this. Could we stop looking through physical eyes and see this region through the eyes of compassion? Because what I see... Is hurting and broken people that need the love of God. That's what I see. God did not plant you here. He did not call you here. He did not move you here just for you to gripe and complain about what Leesville doesn't have. He called you here, planted you here, and moved you here so that you could see through eyes of compassion and be the hands and feet of Jesus. 
That's why he's called you and I here. Amen? Self says, I want it this way or that way. We've got to die to that. Compassion not only interrupts, compassion costs something. Look at the story of the Good Samaritan. How many people walked by him? How many people? I love the story that I've read so many, so many times of the pastor who dressed up like a homeless bum and sat on the steps of his church. And everybody, as church was beginning that Sunday morning, everybody in that church, church leaders, church members, church of attenders, walked right by him, never did anything. And worship's going on, they're wondering where the pastor's at. And when it's time to preach, he walks in in those clothes. And he says, open up your Bible, we're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan. Because a Good Samaritan story, compassion will cost you something. But because we're self-absorbed and selfie driven we're not willing to pay the cost. Aren't you glad someone came by you? Aren't you glad someone helped you? Can I tell you this morning that not all compassion results in resolving everybody's problem? Jesus said, when you were thirsty, you gave me a drink. A simple act of providing a hot dog or a bottle of water to somebody. Simple acts of compassion have multiple effects. My act of compassion may not get somebody saved that day. May not get them delivered that day. But it has an impact that is long lasting. Compassion changes lives. It will cost you something. And also, can I tell you this? Clicking a mouse on social media because you like what somebody else is doing for compassion is not you showing compassion. Compassion changes lives. One act of compassion, one act, one simple act of kindness can impact a multitude of people. I want to close with this story. I think I've shared a little bit of it before. We were pastoring in the inner city, the ghetto. My wife was going through a, a time of depression. Her parents had just divorced. We had just moved from Nebraska to Ohio, from the country, rural setting, to now over two million people. Right in the middle of it. Number one crime rate area in the whole city. That's where we were at. God used something to break my wife's heart and to give her a heart of compassion and a heart of fire that was so incredible. A little boy named Terrence, 14 years old. So we found out that everyone in that neighborhood, those young, young kids, they never ate breakfast. They never ate. So Sundays and Wednesdays, we fed people real food. We did pancakes, sausage, and juice every Sunday morning. Donuts that a bakery would donate to us. Little Terrence, 14 years old, dragging four siblings with him, the youngest one too, into our service to eat breakfast. And then they'd stay for church. We were, Terrence got involved in our youth group and my wife struggling with depression. My wife, because we didn't have anyone to do it, my wife offered to teach a Sunday school class for these little kids. One act of compassion, feeding somebody because they're hungry. Loving someone because their mom's addicted to crack and laid up in the house with another man. This little boy brings his, kid, his brothers and sisters to church every week. Two years ago, he found me on social media. One act of compassion has a lasting impact, right? One act, one act. He was 14 in 2004. Two years ago, 2015, inbox message. Is this PJ who used to pastor Lifeline Community Church in Cincinnati? I said, yes, this is. I recognized the na first name. I didn't recognize the last name. Because in 2004, they didn't have social media. He said, do you remember me? This is Terrence so-and-so and my brothers and sisters' names, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh my gosh, 
do I remember you? Man, how are you? He said, I'm doing great, Pastor. He said, I want you to know that what you and your wife did for me and my brothers and my sisters, all of my family is saved today, and my mom just got saved and water baptized two weeks ago. You don't know the impact of your compassionate heart. You plant a seed now. It's not going to reap a harvest tomorrow. It's going to be a little bit. But you're going to see it. And that just means you've got to keep planting. You've got to keep planting. And if you keep planting good seed, not self-driven, but you keep planting good seed, kingdom-driven, you're going to reap a harvest. Amen? You're going to reap a harvest. I want to ask our worship team if they'll come. I'll ask you if you would to stand with me. you just close your eyes and just focus on the Lord for a moment quick way to get rid of self is to die to self the way to do that is to feel the fire of compassion we need to express our compassion in the form of action compassion has the power to transform So in a selfie-driven society, let's die so that we can really live fulfilled lives. This morning, as they begin to play, if you're here this morning, you've never, ever asked the Lord Jesus Christ to take control of your life. You've never asked Him to be the Lord of your life. And today you want to die to yourself and you want to experience a life of fulfillment in the kingdom of God. If that's you, I want to ask you to lift up your hand. Raise your hand. Lord, I need you. Awesome. I know this morning we're all good Christians. But I also know this morning that we live in a self-absorbed, self-driven world. And I know this morning that there's many of us that struggle with some selfie things in our lives. And Lord, today, I want to die to that. I want to die to myself. I want to die to my self-imposed things, my self-absorption. I want to die to that. If that's you, would you just lift up both hands to heaven? We're going to just give it to God. I die to myself this morning. You must increase, I must decrease. Give it all away to you, God. I release it. I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be a lover of myself or a lover of my pleasure or a lover of these things. I want to just give it to you. I give myself away. I give myself away to you, Lord. I don't know who I'm speaking to right now, but There's a few folks here this morning you you have prayed and asked God to get rid of something in your life multiple times and you continue to struggle with it you continue to struggle with it because you keep feeding it whatever you feed will grow so today today is the day of death where you die to that thing 
But it's your choice. It's your decision. I'm going to ask you to do something brave. I'm going to ask you to whatever that thing is. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat. No one's making fun of you. No one's going to embarrass you. But I'm asking you to get out of your seat. And you're saying, Lord, today I'm dying to this thing. I'm bringing it to this altar. I'm going to bury it. And I'm going to give it to you at the foot of the cross. And I'm not leaving this service carrying that problem anymore. Thank you, Jesus. As the worship team begins to sing, if you want to come and pray at the altars, the altars are open. You need personal prayer, I'd love to pray with you. We have a team. We have a prayer team that we're putting in place. Brother, Brother Nolan, come on up. Our, our, our prayer team is, is in place. You want prayer. No, one needs, no one's going to dive into your psyche. No one's going to dive into your business. But if you just want prayer, come and receive. Go ahead, ladies.